Awesome. Well, thank you everyone for joining us who's here so far. Um, I do want to take a time to take a moment to introduce our speaker today. Our presenter is Dr. Elena Deschard of Keene University. And my name is Alec, and I am your moderator today for Hawks Learning. Um, we will have a live Q&A session after the presentation, so please enter any questions into Q&A as we go. And now I'm going to go ahead and hand it over to our presenter. Thank you so much, and uh, thank you for the warm introduction. And we'll get started right away. Today, we're gonna to go over the increasing retention through high impact practices. My name is Dr. Elena Deschardin, and I will be reviewing this topic as well as a deep dive into research and best practices in this field. The agenda for this short presentation this morning will consist of a brief introduction. We will review some of the primary goals for the presentation. We'll also discuss some of the areas of growth in terms of the research area, and then review a timeline in a post-pandemic framework. And we'll sum it up with a short, inter, a short conclusion, which introduces further or future research for upcoming times. We're gonna jump right into the introduction. George Coe introduced high-term impact educational practices. An acronym for this is HIP or HIP. He identified 10 elements that compromise undergraduate education. And they include various entities, but the 10 framework ideas really sit with the following. Writing intensive courses, collaboration in terms of assignments and pro projects, undergraduate research diversity in the global enterprise, service learning opportunities, as well as community-based learning internships, crossing over that with capstone courses, as well as projects. And the most important one, which I believe is called intellectual experiences for students. So George Coe really was a pioneer in this development and really fortified this HIP and not only set the stone for future research to take place, but really laid a framework for the development to take shape. Primary goals of this conversation is to not only review back to school successes and key resources, but really set the stage of this post pandemic ideology in the educational arena of undergraduate education and K-12 education and really see the longevity of perspectives as we uh, revolutionize ourselves in this post-pandemic conscious world. Some of the basic high impact educational practices really fortify itself into terminology or what they call as strategies. And these strategies are practices that are sitting themselves in this research framework or ecosystem. And they're trying to really fortify students' attention and retention, as well as longevity perspectives for students. And not only is the research sitting in a demonstrative perspective in terms of engagement, graduation practices and persistence, but also to look at students from various backgrounds and really hone in in the practice of students to really have an enhanced perspective of where these practices are in this longevity sense. So the demands and effort in terms of learning experiences have grown and changed over the course of three, four years post-pandemic. Uh, the world pre-pandemic to here we are post-pandemic and whatever was in between, education had to be developed and changed and morphed into something that really set the stage for the audience and the audience was students. And so now we're sitting in this world of formulating really new, rich and engaging and meaningful information for students as well as faculty to really dig deep into what the needs are. And the needs are high impact educational practices that fills the gap of where we were in the pandemic 
and tries to catapult these groupings of students as well as faculty into this new era of post-pandemic. Interactions, collaborations that foster really deep um, practices and also the handling of new situations where we are right now in terms of post-pandemic. Also high impact practices really helps understand constructive feedback from students and faculty members in the hopes to push out growth and developments opportunity. Not only do we have to be are concerned about development opportunities, but we also should be concerned about encouragement opportunity as well. Application of practices, the acquiring of new knowledge, inquiry based skills to help students really set their stage into the real world. It's about college and career readiness, but it's also about the application to real world practices, those hard skills and also the soft skills. Also, we're no, sitting in this notion of self-reflection. Self-reflection fosters a strong mindset. It also fosters the ability to catapult personal growth. And as we're navigating these times right now, we're setting students up for a lifelong perspective, a grit mindset, students to have perseverance and tenacity in this world, and also understand the impact of these high core educational practices. This is just a little figure to set the stage of what we're going to be talking about in the upcoming slides. As we look at the stage and something like the, the stars and the constellation, we see all these different words on the screen. We're looking at capstone, and internships and e-portfolios and writing intensive courses and learning communities. We're also looking about uh, diversity and global learning. We're all also looking about writing intensive courses and first year seminars and common intellectual experiences. And all these things really set the stage for deep dive conversations in terms of critical thinking and student in independence activities. Next, we'll look at the relationship between high impact practices and student engagement. We'll see that the theoretical framework, student engagement, integration, and retention also plays a role in the interconnecting pieces of this ecosystem. Dating back to the 1970s, Tito was an author, a researcher, a developer, um, and also a presenter. And the study was really adopted in terms of a system approach into college to retain students in the college perspective and also have the ability to shape these students' long-term goals and interaction. And so as we're looking at this old school perspective in the 1970s and fast forward to where we are in 2023, we see the historical trends that were taking place. We wanted students in the college sector. We wanted students sitting in classrooms, but we had to find a way to draw in these students and then retain them in these classrooms. So research from 1970s really kind of dictates where we are in 2023. And that the goal is still the same. We want students here with us in the classroom. We want to keep them in the classroom. But we also want to find a way that allows them to gain those soft skills while gaining those hard skills and then really shaping them for the long-term venture. So what are we to do? So institutions set, set up these opportunities for students and they really set up opportunities for academic performance initiatives. They wanted students to have great interaction with their peers. They wanted faculty and staff to have the interaction as well. And they wanted the alignment and the abilities to take shape as well. So those were 1970 trends. 1970 trends are still the same trends that we're hoping to envision out post-2023. Some of the discussions are really sitting with this academic and social integration of where students are in terms of uh, higher education. And not only are we looking at higher education in terms of institutional experiences, but we're also looking at the mismatch of where we are in terms of engagement and disengagement of students. Why are they disengaged and why were they disengaged in the past of three, four years? Well, the pandemic happened, right? Maybe they were struggling pre-pandemic and in the pandemic, it created a really crippling effect. Now we're in this post-pandemic. Those same students that were struggling pre-pandemic are the same students that are struggling post-pandemic. So we have to find really, really wonderful ways to retain the students in the classroom, dive into the areas of struggling, find the alignment, find the framework, and understand that there are expectations for students, but there are expectations alike. 
experiences students are really coming into three trends. They're looking at the engagement of students in the classroom and in the arena of the ecosystem. They're looking at the likelihood and of the success rate of these students beyond the four walls of the classroom. And they're looking to retain these students within the sector. Why? Because you're hoping that with long-term engagement becomes long-term success outside of the classroom sector. Sometimes when we think about the supports and resources in terms of institutional improvement, we also kind of sit ourselves with this national survey of student engagement. This is a long history of, uh, it's called NSSE, that's the acronym, National Survey of Student Engagement. This has been going on for many years and it's really a nice opportunity. It provides a framework uh, for schools and universities to understand what the quality of undergraduate education is on the student perspective, and also to understand from an evidence base, a qualitative and quantitative understanding. So schools across the country can really dive into and find improvements and, and find ways that are the best practices or the best efforts for those long-term improvements. So right now we have about 1,700 uh, four-year colleges and universities that sit on this survey, and it provides an opportunity, a lens, a, a deep dive approach uh, for diagnostic, but it also provides this long-term perspective too, because we can always take a look back and find the trends in the research and trends in the engagement of the universities. Currently, right now, March uh, 2023, there was a new opening for the survey, and it's called the Beginning College Survey of Student Engagement, BCSSE. Um, and every so often, they open up this survey, and I just wanted to provide a, a current um, opportunity for you to see that right now, students are actually taking this across the, the United States, and they're trying to find different ways and different purposes for academic advisement and what's the best uh, formula for this to take place first year college programs or experience programs or retention initiatives. So currently this is a survey that's happening. And so now with the survey and the data that will be able to be gained from this, colleges and universities will then have real raw information at their fingertips to then make decisions long-term for supports and resources for struggling students, student retention, and their guidelines for which institutions will be able to set up great formulas for their programs. Incorporating high impact practices for retention. This has always been a trend or a theme dating back to the 1970s. 70s, when this first started to come about, a successful transition to colleges or for new students to get into their college classes is always a struggle, and it's been a struggle for us quite some time. It's even more a struggle when we're thinking about these first-year programs, because there's not much data in this, because it's a newer phenomenon. First-year students and first-year programs, this research didn't really start to take shape till about 25 or even 20 years ago, where the thought of is, uh, hey, let me go in and start understanding what's happening here so we can move forward and lay the groundwork for more in-depth research or more in-depth structured programs. So this re-engineering or this re-energizing of what is taking place is a semi-new um, concept. And so now we're looking at this from not only a pre-pandemic setup, current pandemic issues, and then post-pandemic, as well as understanding that this is not a new, this is a new process, but really not a new thinking framework. Because when we talked about the 1970 approach, that was really like the umbrella-like system. So here we are in 2023. Colleges and universities are now wanting this class engagement activity to take shape and really fortify really in-depth conversations. But they're also thinking about exploratory courses and programming and this whole new phenomenon of uh, artificial intelligence that's happening as well, along with creating experience with students that create that connect and peace, like puzzles you know, in a puzzle piece, they're all connecting together and, and some are really into uh, different kinds of setups of curriculum and authentic contexts, but then other pu puzzle pieces talk about those active learning pieces and the developments of the physical classroom and the arrangement. And when you think about all these different puzzle pieces, they all need to come together because if they don't, then one puzzle piece is lingering on the side and things are not 
uh, merging. And then this is where these issues take place. So when you think about creative activities for students, you think about internships or faculty mentoring approaches that can often uh, have ability for developments. These are all great opportunities. You also think about retention and student success, best practices and successful inter, inter, inter initiatives. You also think about high education institutions, complex systems with multi-dimensional structures. You also think about power dynamics in the system. We're focusing on all these different elements and some highlights include Georgia State University, University of South Florida, SNHU, and a couple of highlights as you see on the screen. These are all colleges and universities that have created the framework and pioneered in this development. Additionally, you have what is called improving student well-being. Now, this post-pandemic world, we're talking about students, uh, mental health, well-being, and wellness, overall wellness. And a lot of colleges and programs focus now on the student success along with their, their well-being, their overall well-being. And they're focusing more towards a holistic approach, a comprehensive a development that engages students, that drives in these support groups, that provides um, housing for insecurity concerns, provides opportunities for students to be uh, holistic and comprehensive in terms of their educational development, because it is a journey towards getting their degree. And it is a process and, and all these pathways need to merge in together. So the student is successful. So removing a variable that could lead to them uh, dropping out of school or not graduating then the colleges want to be able to offer this assistance. So understanding that student well-being is important, understanding that robust career development programs are important, understanding all of these entities lead to the success of the students graduating, well-being, career programs, student support, internships, wraparound programs, that's the key words. All of these entities lead to the wholesome process and the holistic developments for students to be successful and for faculty and staff, stake members to rally in their successes as well. I put a little picture on the screen. It's a piece of paper that is ripped up in all these different pieces and that's really to symbolize the variables in this. It's an interconnecting or interwoven process. But if all the puzzles of the pieces are not pulled in together, the puzzle is not going to be whole. So that's why it's important to understand all this. It's important to understand that there's a bigger picture out there, driving in those hard core skills, but understanding that there's soft skills and understanding beyond the four walls of the classroom, students have to be supported and they have to be supported in these wraparound programs. Educational pathways through college start early on in the K-12 sector. And in K-12 sector, students are looking into the college perspectives, they're looking to sit in uh, programs, and they're looking to partner as well. And so institutions have now developed these uh, approaches and these programs to help fortify this process. And retention is always in the back burner. How are we going to retain these students once we have them in their classroom? And what are we going to do to be able to address these achievement gaps? And achievement gaps have been studied for decades and every couple of years there's trends that take place and you know ironically we're looking at now post pandemic but some of the things if you research this area are still the same issues that we've had back to the 1970s students are struggling they're they're managing all these different things wearing many hats you know work home uh, school uh, life right and there's always all these variables that come into play when we're thinking about keeping those students in the classroom. So funding is always an issue that comes up. Um, how to strategize these uh, diversified student populations because we do know that they're coming into the classroom uh, with many levels of um, responsibilities. And those responsibilities may include having a job or two or um, taking care of a family. So it's important to understand the wholeness and the wellness of the students as well. This is just a checklist of some areas that colleges and, and universities to look into uh, connecting students to real world problems and solutions into the classroom and connecting what the students read out currently in the classroom and then outside that's important to see that there's a connection if we're not connecting the pieces for the students 
not going to understand the long-term ventures and the long-term prospects. Yes, you know, the curriculum is really important that they're talking about, but talking through that and seeing that there is opportunities outside beyond the classroom once they grow graduate and looking towards their future is really important as well. Engaging students, connecting them, having very substantial interactions with students um, and meaningful approaches as well. This is just a very quick summary. Institutions of higher education have been focusing on student retention and due to many factors, declining state funding, limitations on, on student increases. Um, academic libraries are also facing challenges in service models and definitely rising costs uh, for academic literature. And when we think about this process, you have to connect back in those soft and hard skills and understanding that students are reading the literature, they're understanding what's happening in the classroom, but they may struggle of how to connect all these different pieces. And that's why student engagement is really important and why we identified the factors of student engagement and early on in the presentation, we have to understand the practices of student engagement and validate that as well. This is the ecosystem, an ecosystem of students that are wanting to be taught they want to be sitting in the classroom, they want to be engaged, but it's just a matter of connecting the, the right and the just pieces of the puzzle. So all students come together and the puzzle connects and it makes whole. So thank you so much for this opportunity. This is just some references that I, I looked at during the completion of this and thank you again. And thank you for putting together that awesome presentation. It does look like we have time for questions now. Um, so thank you all for attending today. We will be emailing you a link later to view the recording once it is available. Um, and if you or any other fellow instructors are interested in presenting for our Learning and Growing webinar series, please submit your proposals to the Learning and Growing website, which I'm linking to the chat now. And to learn more about Hawks positive, how Hawks Learning can make a positive impact on your teaching and student learning, uh, use the links I'm putting in the chat after these initial links um, to learn more. Um, but I do wanna give you guys a chance to ask some questions. So feel free to utilize the Q&A feature here within Zoom. Thank you so much.